Yeah. How about now? One, two, three, three, two, one. Check, check. One, two, three. Mic check. One, two, one, two, three. Not Nothing. Radio. Should be coming to your mic level. And hopefully. Yeah, should be in the mold there. One, two. Mic check. Mic check, check. Aha, uh -huh. there you go. Mic check. One, two, three. Three, two, one. Check, check. Check, 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 check. Yeah, you good? How's that? Sound good? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right. Seriously, Doesn't Mander's exactly Palace, the best anymore. meal I ever had in my life. Yeah, yeah it's board. pretty good. But I, I just, I love Galatoire's. Uh, yeah, Commander Palace is great. <laughs> Commander Palace just thinks a little too much of himself. <laughs> great food. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A, bit, a bit on the pop. This one's pretty good. But, uh, but Galatoire's. Oh, yeah, I already tried tightening those up. Oh. Well, I've never had a bad meal there. Brandon's? Oh, I've anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Anywhere. It's a little hole in the yep. wall. You got the best mufalada in the so world. So what do you think, another week and a half? It looks like I ate a lot. Well, that, yeah. the, <laughs> del the deli <laughs> mufalada is a damn thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and yeah. That, re that relish, the olive salad yeah, the mufalada? Olive. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You guys make me hungry now. I think I just had an orgasm. You buy us lunch? Yeah, that's Commander's Palace. We've got to go. On the political side. Commander's Palace. It's our job. What's that? Oh, it's so muddy. It is. There's still just this.
very second she said. Very good. Lieutenant General Ann, this is Brian Whitman from the briefing room. Can you hear me? Brian, I can hear you loud and clear. How are you? How do you hear me? We hear you very good, General. And again, uh, thank you for taking the time this morning uh, to talk to the Pentagon Press Corps here again. Uh, uh, most of you know Lieutenant General Joseph Eng by now, the Deputy Commander, United States Northern Command, uh, the command that is uh, uh, leading the Department of Defense uh, efforts in uh, the uh, uh, hurricane relief. Uh, he is going to give you a, a, a brief overview uh, of where we've been since the last time that he's talked to you, and then uh, we'll get into some questions, uh, but we uh, uh, will have to keep it uh, relatively short as he is a busy man. So, General, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to update you on the Department of Defense's effort in the support of hurricane recovery. As we speak, there are some 18,000 active military military duty forces uh, alongside 45,000 National Guardsmen making a difference by saving lives and relieving suffering along the catastrophic Gulf Coast and New Orleans. These forces continue to work in partnership with FEMA and our other federal agencies as we stabilize the situation. At the same time, I'd like to point out that uh, Northern Command continues to focus on our mission of homeland defense and assuring our ability to support our potential national needs. Actions in the last 24 hours. Third Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division uh, will close in, in the AO today. Uh, currently they have approximately 1,900 people on the ground of a 2,500-man 25 man commitment. Second, Calv Second Brigade, 1st Cavalry Division has 1,850 people on the ground. They are closed, will link up with the 82nd and uh, work under their control. Search and rescue continues in Louisiana and Mississippi. The Special Purpose um, Marine Force, the 11th MU and the 24th MU, have, uh, have completed uh, deployment and they are engaged in operations as we speak. The Iwo Jima's pier side has become the headquarters for Lieutenant General Henri. The Tortuga is also pier side in New Orleans, uh, assisting in the housing of uh, workers for the city, police, and such. Harbor salvage continues by the Navy and survey of offshore oil, critical oil storage and facilities is in progress. I'd also like to mention the work of our Coast Guard partners. They have been doing tremendous work, uh, working around the clock uh, to rescue people, save lives. In the last 24 hours, we have delivered seven million liters of water, five million pounds of ice, and two million meals ready to eat. Today's efforts. Uh, we will fly uh, 71 hours of reconnaissance, uh, uh, surveilling from the air uh, the damage to uh, get an attempt to, to determine what the priority for mitigation will be. We will continue search and rescue. We will support the evacuation of survivors. We will transport and distribute relief supplies, ice, food, water, and of course medical supplies. We're supporting firefighting efforts and have, uh, have moved some capability to, into the AOR. I, uh, you, you saw it on TV yesterday, I'm sure. We will work, uh, continue to work food control and the, and, the, uh, and the sourcing of food supplies, and we're working to make sure proper mortuary uh, uh, affairs support is in place. There's repositioning of troops to make sure that we have the right people in the right place to uh, get into the watered areas uh, and do a ground uh, house by house uh, search to see if there are any other people who need to be rescued. I would add that our, that our allies begin to arrive. The Canadian, Canadians have divers in the water off Pascagoula, Mississippi, helping with harbor reconstruction. And Mexico will have a vessel arrive today that will join the Bataan in the, in the Gulf and uh, begin uh, search and rescue. It's a vessel that has helicopter platforms that can assist in the, in the recovery. In the coming 24 to 72 hours, we will continue to explore isolated areas and conduct rescue. 
We will provide for immediate needs of residents awaiting evacuation. We will expand the house-to-house -house searches. We will expand medical facilities as needed for sick and injured. And we will deploy additional ships and, av and aviation assets should they become needed. The comfort will arrive within the next 72 hour period and we will continue to respond to FEMA requests for assistance. In summary, we continue to save lives and, and reduce human suffering. We're fighting fires, restoring levees, recovering, establishing communications and transporting vital supplies. You will continue to see progress. And let me close by saying uh, we are prepared to respond to any threat to our homeland. Uh, that's what I have for you now. I, I'd stand by for your questions. Charlie, let's go ahead and get started. General Charlie Ollinger with Reuters. You say that you all will con uh, continue to support the evacuation uh, in New Orleans. How about, how about forced evacuation, people who are, who are taken from their homes against their will as ordered by the, uh, by the mayor of New Orleans? Will the National Guard uh, or, or our regular troops take part in forcing these people to do, which, which I guess would, you know, go into the law enforcement area. I've been watching the news this morning and I understand that this is an issue. The situation as I know it now is that civil authorities in Louisiana and New Orleans are discussing this issue. It's not clear to us what the exact state of, of the mission is. Uh, we would believe, there, we are told there's some 900 policemen in New Orleans, we would certainly see forcing evacuation as a first priority for them to work. Uh, if the, if the uh, authorities in the state of Louisiana chose to use their National Guards in a, in a state status, that would certainly be permissible in, in their call. Uh, when this turns into a law enforcement issue, which we perceive forced evacuation is, regular troops would not be used. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, just one other thing, perhaps you could make this clear. The troops, the National Guard troops from other states sent to New Orleans, are they under, are they under orders from, from, from the Louisiana governor or do they remain, in other words, could they be used for, uh, for police duty? I would refer that uh, question to General Blum and to uh, Louisiana, but it's our understanding under the Guard's emergency uh, uh, support program, they are under the authority of the Adjutant General of the State of Louisiana. Thank you. Let's go over here to Jamie. Jamie McIntyre from CNN. General, uh, I want to ask you about a story that's in the New York Times today about a couple of Navy pilots who apparently were dressed down by their commander for, uh, they were supposed to be delivering supplies and they decided uh, uh, to go rescue some people in the early stages of this uh, operation. Now I understand you might not have any knowledge of this specific incident, but I want to ask you about it because it underscores uh, a more general criticism of the initial military response, and that is that it was uh, too much by the book, uh, too much uh, waiting for orders, and not enough initiative, improvisation, uh, adaptation to the reality of what was uh, on the scene, and that's why this story has gained some resonance. Can you respond to the idea that uh, the, the mission was not sufficiently adaptive, uh, there wasn't enough creativity employed and enough uh, uh, judgment by people right at the uh, front lines, uh, deferring to their judgment, uh, in order to get aid to people faster. Well, Jamie, first of all, I had not heard of this issue, but I would, uh, I would not agree with, uh, with uh, the line of reasoning that's been put forward. Our priorities were save lives, sustain lives, and then recover and reconstitute. Uh, by, I guess, last Wednesday afternoon, there were some 100 to 150 helicopters in the air. They were delivering food. They were doing search and rescue. Uh, we in the military, I hope, understand our responsibility to save lives if, if in fact, that position is presented to us. <clears throat> that, uh, and I know, this, I, I know this is quite an issue. On, on Sunday the 28th, we deployed defense coordinating officers into Mississippi and Louisiana. On, on Monday the 29th, uh, at first light, the, the hurricane hit. On Tuesday morning, when everybody woke up in Louisiana, the sun was shining, and we were all talking about what a good day it was and how we'd passed the, uh, pass the hazard. Uh, Tuesday afternoon, or sometime during the day Tuesday, General Honore and his task force arrived at Camp Shepard, Mississippi to support the relief effort. Uh, we think, and we know we were leaning forward. 
We know that we move vessels, uh, we move the Bataan up behind the storm, uh, and very quickly helicopters were in the air over the disaster area. Just to follow up, General, do you believe that the initial response was sufficiently adaptive to the reality on the ground? Were you able to, 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 to uh, in a reasonable amount of time, figure out what was really going on and change the plan to accommodate what the reality was on the ground? I think it was pretty adaptive, Jamie, but I won't go further than that because there will be great uh, uh, reliving of this incident in the months ahead, and uh, time will tell. I think for the moment we need to focus hard on getting the job done and relieving the suffering of the people in Louisiana and Mississippi. Let's go ahead, Bob. General, uh, this is Bob Burns from AP. Uh, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the mortuary affairs part of the uh, operation. Could you explain exactly what the extent to which the military is involved in that and, and, and who in the military and, and where they're doing that work? They are, they are, there are no mortuary affairs teams from the military and the AR. They are all civilian sourced at this time. We know how many are there uh, and we believe for the moment it's adequate. We have a mortuary affairs company uh, at, Fort, Peter, at uh, Fort Lee, Virginia, in Petersburg, that's on 12-hour alert to respond to the area should the need arise. Uh, General Jim McLeshevsky with NBC. Uh, you said a moment ago that on Tuesday morning you woke to sunshine. Everybody thought that uh, uh, the worst was over. Uh, and indeed, apparently, there were some headlines in the area that said we dodged a bullet. Uh, uh, but the evidence indicates that, uh, that the three levee breaks uh, in New Orleans had already taken place. How is it that so many people could have missed the significance of those levee breaks uh, and, and the disaster, potential disaster, that those breaks represented? Jim, I really can't speak to that because uh, none of our forces were in New Orleans that day. I think you would have to refer that to the people who maintain those levees. I ask you, did anybody in the local or state government uh, confer uh, or discuss the levee breaks and the potential threat that those breaks posed with the National Guard uh, uh, or anybody at NORTHCOM uh, prior to that uh, uh, Tuesday? I'm not aware of any discussion with Northern Command. I can't speak to who else they might have, they might have spoken to. I, don't, I have no further information on that. Okay, I'm thank not you, aware Jim. of a discussion between Northern Command General Brett Baer with Fox right. News Channel. Uh, right now you have about 60,000 troops on the ground. Yesterday Defense Secretary Rumsfeld said there may be a point at which uh, there may be too many forces on the ground. Uh, are you approaching that point uh, and is there an analysis of maybe over flooding the area with, uh, with forces? I don't think we're over flooded at this point, but as in any operation, there will come a time when we'll have to transition and begin to move forces out. And there may be an intermediate time where we will bring in different unique forces and take some of the ones that are there out. Uh, but, but certainly it's appropriate to start uh, considering what's your transition plan and at what point you reach out. We're not far enough along at this point to, to, to talk about that. What unique forces? What, what unique forces? You mentioned unique forces. Uh, th there may become a time when the appropriate forces on the ground are only, only logistics, or the appropriate forces on the ground are only ones needing to uh, uh, assist in installing housing. You, you just never know until, uh, until the situation develops. Every day we review what the need is, what the requirement on the ground is, what's the requirement for the next 72 hours so that we can be prepared to respond on time, on target. General Al Pesson with Voice of America. Mm -hmm. Considering that, as you said, you forward deployed uh, relief forces in advance of the storm, <coughs> would the response have been quicker and more effective if the military had not had to wait for the request for aid from the civilian authorities? And has this experience indicated to you a need for uh, some sort of a change or reorganization of procedures of how to deal with such situations? I think that's, uh, that's a question to be answered in Washington. Uh, we were prepared to respond according to the, to the laws of our land, and that's what we did. Would it have been faster if you hadn't had to uh, wait for the civilian requests from an operational point of view? 
If you look at the time it took us to get there, I think we had a pretty daggone fast, uh, fast response. Let's go to Tom. General Tom Bowman with the Baltimore Sun. I know some active duty uh, military bases are being used for evacuees. Uh, Maxwell Air Force Base, and I know Eglin is uh, constructing some housing for evacuees. And I'm just wondering, do you plan on having more active duty military bases used for uh, housing the evacuees, particularly since uh, states like Texas are saying they're strained by the number of evacuees that are coming in? I know that we, I, I can't give you a good answer to your question. I know that we've looked at the military bases as, to make them available. And I know that, for example, at Fort Polk, Louisiana, soldiers deploying from the Louisiana Guard from Iraq will be given uh, housing should they need it until they can, uh, they can recover. Uh, but uh, if FEMA comes in and needs us to house people in appropriate places, we will certainly take appropriate action. Well, what has FEMA said today? Do they say we don't need additional active duty military bases? What have they told you? I don't have current data on you. I'll have to get back to you if you need an answer. Let us get back to you on that. Let's go. Uh, uh, General, it's Mark Mazzetti with the Los Angeles Times calling. Calling. <laughs> questioning. Um, two questions, really, actually. One, first is um, you, you detailed some, some prepositioning of, of forces and units in advance of the storm. Can you just detail a little bit about what you guys did in advance? And, and secondly, are, are you confident that from NORTHCOM's perspective, you did all you could do in advance um, of the storm, uh, you know, before the, uh, you got the actual call from the civ civilian agencies? I believe we took appropriate action to answer your second question first. Uh, we moved coordination effort into the storm. When we saw that the storm was, was becoming larger, we began to alert uh, search and rescue type vehicles and we, we alerted the Bataan, to which was in the Gulf, to follow the storm in. Uh, that's, the, that's the macro of the actions we took. And I would remind you again that General Henri was in the disaster, was in the disaster area on Tuesday. We've got time for a couple more. Let's go over here and then over to Matt. All right, General, Jeff Shogel with Stars and Stripes. Uh, we talked to a Louisiana state official last week who said officials had ruled out airdropping supplies because they were afraid of causing riots in New Orleans. Was this more of a decision not to do it, or were forces incapable of launching such a massive airdrop? Uh, we talked about airdropping supplies, not, not C-130s with parachutes, but supplies out of helicopters, and if you recall, uh, images of people doing just that. I, I'm not aware of any discussion about worrying about riots if we dropped uh, supplies, certainly not here at Northern Command. Why not use C-130s if you have so many at Arkansas? Uh, it, you, with the number of helicopters we had there, uh, probably better to do it that way. Can probably more precise. Let's go over here to uh, Matt Kelly. General Matt Kelly from USA Today. Uh, can you say uh, how, if and how many uh, units that uh, uh, aren't doing uh, Katrina relief that may have otherwise done so uh, because those units are uh, training for or plan for future deployment to Iraq, and if uh, there are any units that uh, may have been deployed to Iraq but will not because they're uh, doing Katrina relief? There are no units that, that were on schedule to be deployed to, to Iraq that will not be because of the hurricane, and we diverted no units or changed any effect of any unit that I'm aware of because of Iraq. I can, I can say, sure, Iraq did not impact this disaster when it came to forces. And I would go back to my comment, and we stand ready to react to any other threat against our homeland uh, as we speak. All right, we've got time for about one more. Let's go over here. Sir, Jim Garamon with American Forces Press Service. The uh, storm hit a lot of bases, too. Are there any unaccounted for soldiers, sailors, or airmen from the, uh, from the storm? Not that I'm aware of right now, but I'll have to get back to you with exact, exact numbers. That's being worked more through the services than it is us here at, at Northern Command. Thank you. 
General, I uh, just want to thank you again for taking the time. I know we're trying to get into a little bit of a regular pattern uh, so that uh, we can have some uh, awareness of what the Northern Command is doing and uh, the efforts uh, in this relief operation. And so we hope that we'll have you back very soon uh, and uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, I appreciate it very much. Y'all take care. Thanks for your work.